in this lecture, I'm going to be looking at state crime. And again, this is another um, area that um, is quite small. Um, likelihood of it coming up as a 30 marker, maybe, maybe not, probably more with inclusive with um, globalization and crime. But again, I am not an examiner. I do not write the exams. I have no idea what they're going to actually do. But within this lecture, we're going to look at the different definitions of state crime, types of state crime, and the explanations of why state crime is able to occur, as well as the issues with studying state crime. So let's get straight into looking at the definitions of state crime. Now, again, um, just like we've, we've seen in other areas, there is no single definition of crime. Green and Ward um, define state crime as an illegal or deviant activities perpetrated by or with the complicity of state agencies. So what they're talking about here is um, when anyone to do with the government, whether that be government employees um, or agencies within the government, such as the Department for Education, military, um, Department of Justice, people like that, engage in illegal or deviant activities. So the illegal will obviously be those ones which are against statute law, um, deviant against the norms and values of society. But it's not as simple as that because the government is the ones who are creating the law. So they can just write laws so that they can get away with what they want to do. So we have to kind of look at some more nuanced definitions. So we're going to look at the idea of domestic law. Um, we're going to look at social harm and zeniology. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, we'll look at international law and we'll look at human rights. Now, again, there is going to be a lot of new terminology within this lecture and there are a lot of wonderfully named sociologists that we're going to discuss. So definition one comes from Shambliss and we've talked about Shambliss before. We, we've looked at their work in other areas. But when it comes to state law, Shambliss says that a state law is acts defined by law as criminal but committed by state officials in pursuit of their jobs as representatives of the state. So this goes beyond what Green and Ward were saying by being more specific in the sense of it's anyone who is a state official, so that is essentially anyone who's employed by the government, who breaks the law in the role of the state official. So they're doing it as part of their job as a state official, not as a private individual. So an example here would be the MPs expenses scandal, which I guess is still slightly ongoing when you look at some of the expenses that uh, MPs are currently um, claiming for. But these, this, this wasn't a private criminal act because they were doing it within their role as a as an MP and it was part of their job uh, or a benefit of their job, I should say, to um, claim the, the expenses. Just people went a little bit too far with it and probably still are um, considering their wage. Um, but again, this is limited to what is and is not allowed within domestic law. So Mikulowski talks more about the harm caused by state crimes uh, in what's the study of zemiology. And Mikulowski say, says that state crime includes illegal acts, but also legally permissible acts whose consequences are similar to those of illegal acts in the harm that they cause. So we're not looking necessarily at what is being done, more the impact of what is being done. And we can use the example of the austerity policies in the UK um, for this. So the policies that government have put in place to save money um, has had quite a significant impact in terms of the harm that it's caused the people of the UK. Um, we've seen a decline in public services. 
um, people who um, are unable to um, afford the basics, uh, who have to jump through 10 million hoops in order to get benefits to support them when they're rightfully entitled to them. Um, so these policies are under Michalowski's um, definition would be considered a state crime because although the government isn't doing anything technically illegal, the policies that they're putting in place are causing harm to the level of something that would be considered illegal. Okay. You've then got, the next one is Roth and Mullins who look at state crime in the definition of international law. International law is a bit of a um, weird one because there isn't a single body who determines international law. It's not the same sort of law as you would have on a domestic level. It's more agreements between nations regarding what is and is not acceptable. Um, so countries can choose to opt in or opt out as they see fit. Now we do have international bodies such as the United Nations, NATO, EU, um, etc., who kind of monitor these agreements. Um, but Ross and Mullins says that a state crime is an action by or on behalf of a state that violates these international laws and or domestic state laws. So in this case, we are trying to, uh, Roth and Mullins is trying to bring together that domestic statute law as well as these international agreements. And the example they give is unlawful war. For example, the Gulf War in the 1990s, where um, it has come to light that the reason that people went to, or countries went to war in the Gulf against Saddam Hussein was based on falsified re um, reports of weapons of mass destruction um, and who was complicit in that, um, whether it was the US on their own or whether it was the US with the United Kingdom, that's still up for debate. But this kind, this definition kind of tries to bring together both the domestic and the international element of um, state crime. The third one comes from Schwerdinger, lovely sociologist names, who um, says that state crime is any violation of people's basic human rights by the state or their agents. Now, again, those agents could be the military, police, um, officials within the government, except uh, as we talked about before. And this is all based around the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, which was written in 1948. Now, this may sound like, seem like a really good way of defining state law, but not every country has signed up to the Declaration of Human Rights. So therefore, you can't hold a country accountable to a standard that they have not signed up to themselves. Um, for example, the United States. They, their first lady was instrumental, Eleanor Roosevelt was instrumental in writing the Dec United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. However, as a country, the United States never agreed to it. They said that they didn't need the, U the Declaration of Human Rights because they had their constitution, um, which already enshrined the, the rights within the, the declaration within their rights in the constitution. I'm not a constitutional historian or lawyer, so I cannot say how accurate and truthful that is. But there are lots of other countries who are not signed up to the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights. So therefore, holding them to account on this standard perhaps isn't the best way to define state crime. Now, as we've said, having five definitions of state crime makes it very difficult to enforce any act as a form of state crime. And we'll come on to how states get around this later on in the lecture. Let's first look at types of state crime. So here we're talking, this is the work of Eugene McLaughlin, 
who kind of grouped together um, different forms of state crime into four categories. Political crimes, crimes by security and police forces, economic crimes and social and cultural crimes. And we're going to go through these a little bit more detail now. Um, but by using these categories, we can kind of see whether or not countries are engaging in criminal activity with which kind of encompasses all four or all five of the definitions that we've talked about. So what do we mean by political crimes? Political crimes can be determined as corruption, censorship and war crimes. So it kind of then subsets, if you like. With political corruption, we're talking about how um, governments can take various, it, it, it's not a simple, that's corrupt. So it can be siphoning off of public money to their private bank accounts. I mean, we could look at that in terms of um, COVID and PPE contracts and uh, what's her name, Michelle Mohan, Mo Monahan, um would be an example of that. She was given the contract for a company that didn't exist prior to COVID um, and never actually um, gave or fulfilled the contract of workable, usable PPE. And this links into the next one, unfairly gov granting government contracts in return for bribes. Now, when we're talking about bribes, we're not just talking about monetary bribes. This can be uh, bribes for position, for power, for access. Um, those sort of things can be also returned or also considered bribes. There is blackmail as well in terms of give us this contract or we're going to do something negative or release some negative information about you. Um, that is a different form of crime in, in and of itself. Um, but again, through the COVID um, pandemic, we saw a lot of government contracts being given out to friends. There was this VIP lane um, that allowed certain friends of the Conservative Party to access um, these contracts. And a lot of these companies had never done anything to do with PPE prior to COVID. So there was obviously the, the kind of dodginess going on there as well. And then you've also got electoral fraud or vote rigging. Um, so this is something that is being discussed at the moment in terms of the need for photographic identification to vote in elections, which is excluding a large number of particularly younger voters who may not have a passport or a driving license um, and the fact that older voters can use their Oyster card for ID but younger voters can't, that could be considered a sense of vote rigging. By preventing younger voters from voting, you are perhaps rigging the election. Political censorship then is um, when a government attempts to conceal fake, distort or falsify information its citizens receive by suppressing or crowding out political news that the public might receive through news outlets. So this is not necessarily the kind of blanking, uh, blacking out of letters from the military to the um, families that we saw during World War Two, although that is a form of censorship that was considered necessary for national security. What we're talking about here, oh sorry, um, is releasing information in a very calculated way, um, sending out false information, um, fake news, all of these things would be considered a form of political censorship. Um, and then we get to war crimes. So there are two types of war crimes, illegal war, which we've already discussed. So this is not in self-defence or declared by the UN. And crimes committed during war, such as the Abu Ghraib prison um, crimes and bombing of civilians or the bombing of um, areas that are of no 
strategic um, value. So with war crimes, these are more prosecutable than perhaps censorship or political corruption, because we do have the International um, War Crimes Tribunal in The Hague, which um, came out of the Nuremberg trials and the Tokyo trials post-World War II. And there are a number of war criminals who are still awaiting trial or in the midst of trial in The Hague. The next type of state crime is crimes by security or police forces. And these can be subsetted into four sections, genocide, torture, imprisonment without trial and the disappearance of dissidents. And we've got lots of examples of these throughout history. For example, in genocide, which means any act committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a nation, uh, sorry, a national, ethnic or raci racial or religious group. Now, the it's awful to say the most famous of these is the Holocaust from 1935 to 1945. However, since then, there have been other forms of genocide. Cambodia in the 1970s under the, um, oh, I can't remember the name now, um, Rwanda 1990s with the Hutus and the Tutsis and the Bosnia Herzegovina in the 1990s as well, which was Bosnian Muslims and um, Serb um, who were um, the Serbs who were anti Bosnian Muslims. So as much as we would like to think that since World War Two, we've learned our lesson. Perhaps not, because we're still seeing genocides occurring in more modern um, society. Torture is the practice or action of inflicting severe pain on someone as a punishment or in order to force them to do or say something. So this is not just kind of I'm going to take your pocket money away if you don't do your chores type thing. We're talking physical um, pain. We're talking severe pain. Um, we're talking permanent damage. So this was seen in Guantanamo Bay with waterboarding. Um, Operation Demetrius in Ulster in Ireland during um, the Northern Irish Northern Ireland Troubles um, pre-1997 where they use sensory deprivation to try and um, get suspected terrorists, um, IRA members to talk. Um, we've seen it in many, many places where it's not necessarily beating of somebody. It can be psychological torture, um, such as sensory deprivation, being sat in a dark cold room with no noise no interaction is torturous i know it sounds like bliss at times but no it is a form of torture not allowing somebody to sleep is a form of torture that is used by governments imprisonment without trial detained in a prison or psychiatric facility without knowledge of why or for how long now in the us and this links back to guantanamo bay um, citizens could be held on suspicion of terrorism indefinitely. Not that they have been convicted of terrorism, on suspicion of terrorism. Now, the UK did try and introduce this in the um, after the July seventh bombings in um, nineteen uh, sorry two thousand and five. However, um, it didn't get through. And we can now only uh, think it's up to four weeks or 28 days, something like that, um, with court order in order to con continue to gather evidence. But if there isn't enough evidence to convict at the end of that time, they must be released. There are still people in Guantanamo Bay under suspicion of terrorism that have never been convicted. They've never been um, had enough evidence to convict them. So they're there under suspicion of, of terrorism. 
And there have been cases of people who were there, who have been in Guantanamo Bay, who the, it later turned out that they just happened to share the same name of a suspected terrorist. And they, in fact, were nothing to do with that terrorist or terrorist organisation. And the final one of um, is the disappearance of dissidents. Now, political dissidents refers to any um, person who is speaking up against the government. Excuse me. Um, or a, or a or policies against government. So dissident it means to to show dissatisfaction with the government or in opposition to government policies. Um, now, we don't have exact figures for this. Um, and again, we'll look at how governments uh, get around this later in the lecture. But um, what we we've, there are rumours of this happening in China, in Russia and in Saudi Arabia, where people will suddenly just not be around. Economic crimes. So there are two versions here, two types of economic crime. The first is violations of health and safety laws, where governments knowingly allow health and safety breaches in public services in order to save money or create profit. So we've seen this. We, we've talked about Chernobyl nuclear disaster previously. It is a go, it was a government run um, nuclear power plant, but in order to get it up and running quicker um people were not trained properly systems were not implemented properly which eventually led to the disaster flint michigan we've got water contamination where the government knowingly knew that this water was undrinkable to the point that people could set fire to what was coming out of their taps um and have done nothing about it and flint michigan is still fighting to this day for cleanup and the challenger space shuttle so this was a um the government um had been told of possible issues with certain parts of the shuttle that in certain weather conditions if they tried to launch it would lead to an explosion they ignored this and nasa is a government agency so this was why it comes under a state crime the Challenger shuttle launched under these conditions, a bracket or um, something on the shuttle broke. And as they were um, launching, the shuttle exploded. OK, the second type is economic policies which cause harm to the citizenry. So these are policies which government knows will lead harm to the citizens of their country but implement them anyway and again here we can talk about austerity and the fact that the government has been told multiple times by multiple different international agencies and charities and fiscal think tanks that their policies are causing a problem yet they still implemented them and then finally, we get to the social and cultural crimes. So let, if we deal with the social first, this includes institutional racism. And we've already talked about this in terms of economic, uh, sorry, ethnicity and crime, but police forces targeting certain groups in society. But we can also link it into things like education with ethnocentric curriculum, um, where the, the state agencies, the Department for Education, the Department for Justice, the military and and um, all of these agencies are, have policies and procedures which are institutionally racist. Um, when it comes to cultural crimes, we're talking about the destruction of indigenous and native culture and heritage. And this could be physical destruction, such as the ISIS destruction of churches and shrines in Mosul and the US destruction of Native Amer Native um indian sites and lands or it could be through symbolic violence um where we've seen um indigenous children who are taken from their families and put in institutions um to be raised in a more culturally acceptable manner 
Um, and these schools have been proven time and time again to have been horrific places, causing deaths of young children, um, PTSD in survivors. They were awful. And these were ways of essentially trying to get rid of this native, uh, this indigenous culture and their indigenous heritage by forced assimilation. So why does green crime, uh, sorry, state crime occur? So there are three main theories explaining the existence of state crime, integrated theory, modernity and social condition. Some of this will link back to our theories of crime and deviance that we did earlier in the unit, um, but they, they take it that step further in terms of uh, state crime. So the first one is Green and Ward's integrated theory. And this theory suggests that green crime arise, oh, sorry, state crime arises from similar circumstances that we see in blue collar, white collar corporate crime. And by looking at these three features and how they interconnect, we can see how state crime comes around. So it's opportunity, motivation and failures of control. And when we're talking about failures of control, we are talking about um, how there is no consequence or there is limited consequence for states and governments in terms of their criminality. Opportunity, there's a means and there's a way. And motivation, usually some form of financial reward. We are in a capitalist society after all. So where governments can, that motivation of offenders is a bit more looking at the individuals rather than the agencies, but it is the end incorporation of these three elements that have led to state crime being occurred. So it, it's not dissimilar to what we've talked about in terms of individual criminality. Zygmunt Bowman, Bowman, I love his name, um, says that it's the fact that we're in modern society and the features of, a mo of modernity that have led to allowing state crime to be possible. So he talks about the division of labour and the fact that no one is fully responsible of anything. We're all responsible for our own individual parts of the bigger machine and because we're able to do that or because of that you are able to extricate yourself from, from responsibility it's not my fault i was just doing my bit which then because you've kind of can't men, um boxed up so i can't think of it i can't say that other word uh, boxed up different elements of state um, responsibility, no one part is responsible. Um, Bureaucratisation, normalisation of the act by making it repetitive and routine, dehumanisation of the victim. And this links in back to that division of labour. By making what they do repetitive and routine, they're not going to necessarily see the bigger picture they're not they're looking at their individual through their individual lens rather than seeing the big picture and by dehumanizing the victims of the state crime so if we take austerity for example it's that belief that benefits recipients are in some way defective or in some way responsible for their situation we're dehumanizing them he then talks about in instrumental rationality um, and this links back to Weber. And if you remember Weber's idea of um, action, instrumental rationality, this is the most effective way to achieve the goal, regardless of the goal itself. So in terms of austerity, governments want to reduce national debt. The easiest way, uh, most efficient way to do that is to reduce spending regardless of the fact that the spending the the austerity measures are causing a problem and science and technology 
scientific and technological knowledge to justify the means and the motive. We we need to do it this way. We need to have this um, system in place because of technology or because of uh, the means of technology. So by these four features of modern society, we are able to um, allow great uh, state crimes to occur. Social conditions. So the Kelman and Hamilton um, say that unlike citizen crime, state crimes tend to be more crimes of obedience than deviance. And he and they identify three features that produce crimes of obedience. So what they mean by this is it's not people doing something against the norms and values. It's the I'm just following orders, which is also referred to as the Nuremberg defense. So post World War Two. Uh, Nazi prisoners of war who were standing trial for the Holocaust, their defence became, I was just following orders. I was just doing what my superiors told me to do. And this was able to happen because you've got these three elements, authorisation, routinization, and dehumanisation. So the following of orders People above me, people in power have uh, uh, said that this is OK. So any moral ob um, objections I might have are replaced by my duty to obey, obey those in power. And for those of you who do psychology, this links in to um, Milgram's study of obedience. Um, the routinization. The, what they're doing is just part of day to day life. So therefore. It's done without thinking. You just kind of do it. You don't think about it. Um, it's routine and dehumanization. The victims are portrayed as subhuman. So normal morality doesn't apply. And again, we saw this in the Holocaust with the groups, the Jews, uh, gypsies, Romani gay, lesbian, LGBTQ communities, anyone basically the Nazis didn't like, they were not human. They were below human. And the most human of humans were the um, blonde, blue eyed people. OK, so state crime becomes acceptable because you are following orders. But why is state crime so serious? So first of all, it's the scale of state crime. It's not just impacting an individual. It is impacting an entire citizenry. Mikulowski and Kramer said that great power and great crimes are inseparable. Economic and political elites can bring death, disease and loss to tens of thousands of people with a single decision. OK. And again, we can see this through COVID. Um, where decisions that were made by government led to, to thousands of people. Um, dying of COVID. Um, so we're not talking about small scale. It's in fact in one, two, five people. We're talking about tens of thousands, even millions of people. So state crime could, uh, under a zemiology definition, is one of the most serious forms of crime because of the amount of harm that is being caused. The other problem we've got is that, or seriousness, is the fact that the state is the source of law. It's the states who create the law. The government is the one who writes the law. So they have the power to conceal their crimes, make them harder to detect, and actually change the law to benefit what they're doing. The concept of national sovereignty means that it's difficult for international bodies to intervene. As I said earlier, we have international bodies such as the UN who are essentially a monitoring body because states can choose to be members or not. They don't have any tangible power. They can't just step in or hold a government to account. 
there are processes in place. And an example of this is Russia. Whenever the UN have done things or tried to hold sanctions against Russia for their actions, they just left. In which case there was very little the UN could do. And because of this nature of state crime coming from governments, they are able to manipulate people into thinking that they're not doing anything wrong and this culture of denial. So with the 24 hour news cycle and human rights movements and all of this, states have had to become better at hiding and justifying their crimes. Cohen talks about this spiral of state denial. And this is a brilliant uh, example of this would be Partygate. And um, the crime, uh, it, it's not quite at state level, but it is a state crime. Initially, it was kind of like, no, 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 they didn't happen. It, the, the parties didn't happen. Then it was kind of, when the evidence came out from photographs and things like that, it was then, okay, it did happen, but it wasn't a party. It wasn't a social gathering. It was a work event. Um, and then when more evidence came out, it then became, okay, yeah, okay, we were having a social gathering, but we, because of the nature of the situation we're in, we needed some stress relief. We needed to do this. So they go, Cohen's spiral of denial is a case of almost gaslighting people into believing what they want you to believe. And this links into my, Matzer and Sykes neutralization theory, justification of the act through denial of the victim. So again, we go back to Partygate. We weren't hurting anybody. Denial of the injury. Yeah, but we're different to you. Denial of responsibility not our fault condemning the condemners but you did it anyway you did it as well and appeal appealing to a higher loyalty we are trying to um run a country during a pandemic give us a break okay so when the the problem we get with or the the seriousness that comes with state crime comes from the fact that governments will gaslight their pe their people to to justify what they're doing through these spirals of denial and the neutralization theory so when it comes to researching state crime it is an area that sociologists are interested in but they face a number of problems cohen identifies these problems as being strategies of denial and justification so it's difficult to study state crime when you've got this gaslighting coming from governments the government is able to reclassify the crime because they're the ones that write the crime you've got censorship and power coming from government they can stop you doing what you want, doing this research there are no official statistics or victim surveys when it comes to state crime because it's not prosecuted at a national level and a lot of sociologists are reliant on secondary data from the media and obviously the media, we've talked about media and crime and that sensationalization, infotainment, but also the censorship that comes from government limiting the information that is out there. Green and Ward also point out that it can be quite dangerous and difficult to um, study green, uh, state crime because these people, you've, we've seen the disappearance of dissidents. We've seen how governments can manipulate situations to make the researcher the bad guy. And Toombs and White say quite clearly, states can use their power to prevent or hinder sociologists doing their research. Sociologists can put in a Freedom of Information Act regarding what they're looking at, but it's the government to say whether or not they're going to say yes or no to it. And generally, if it's something they don't want out there, they will say no. So it's very difficult to actually study state crime. And a lot of what we've talked about today is theory and conjecture because there is no way to prove or disprove um, the theories. So what do you need to know? You need to be able to define state crime and know those five definitions of state crime. You need to be able to understand the different types of state crime and the formats that state crime can um, take. 
as well as the impact and the seriousness of state crime and why and why state crime exists as well as some of the elements of the difficulty in studying state crime as that can be your evaluation.